morning, good morning. God bless you, God bless you. Would you mind standing all over the sanctuary as we just honor the Lord today? If you love the Lord with all your heart, come on and give him a hand clap of praise in this place today. Father, we love you and we thank you. We're your sons and your daughters. God, we're just in awe of you. We're in awe of your strength. We're in awe of your mercy. We're in awe of your grace. We're in awe of your love, God. We thank you that you choose to be in right relationship with us, God, and we don't want to take that for granted. So for the next few fleeting moments, with the clapping of our hands and the lifting of our voice and the stomping of our feet, God, we're going to celebrate you with everything that we got because you are worthy of all the glory and all the honor. So we celebrate you today, Jesus, in Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord and hit the play. To rise as we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord. Center rise as we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord.
Jenkins, and this is your Rehoboth Review in 60 Seconds. Rehoboth women, you're invited to the home of Miss Pat Harris for game night on October 7th from 7 to 9 p.m. Register at rehoboth.org slash women. Rehoboth students, sign up now to go to Six Flags on October 10th and for a fall retreat at Camp Grace on November 4th through 6th. You can register for both at rbcrec.org. Trunk or treat will be here before we know it. Please consider giving individually wrapped candy to the church so we don't run out. You can drop your candy at the welcome desk or you can order online and have it delivered to the church. We also need volunteers to staff the event and to decorate their cars. Email Tina Bush at Rehoboth.org to let her know you'll volunteer. As always, you can find out this information and more at Rehoboth.org slash engage. I'm Denise Jenkins, and this has been your Rehoboth Review in 60 Seconds. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. To you on the line, you, you hear us laughing. You can't see what's happening in the sanctuary, uh, but it's okay. It was, hey, man, uh, good morning to you. Good morning, good morning, good morning. If you're excited about being in the house of the Lord, would you mind putting those hands together and giving him a hand clap of praise? What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord today, and we don't take that lightly. There are many people around the country who would love to be able to do what we get to do today, but they're unable to. Their lives are in danger, and so we're thankful that God allows us the opportunity in this country to be able to just stand and just declare his name and declare his truth uh, any and every time that we desire to. Uh, if this is your very first time worshiping with us, this is the very first time you've walked in these doors and did worship with us, we want to say thank you. Uh, this is the very first time time that you've online done worship with us, we want to say thank you. You could have worshiped anywhere in the country, but you chose to worship with the Rehoboth Church family, and I say it every week, and I say thank you. We say thank you that. So to you that are in the building today, if this is your very first time, or if you come a few times, but you just never met us at our welcome table, if you will meet us at that welcome table right over there immediately after service, we have a special gift that we want to share with you, and that gift just says thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because you chose to worship with us today, and we're grateful for that opportunity. And to you that are online, if this is your very first time with us, we would that you would just drop in Facebook or send us an email. Let us know that you worship with us today so that we can contact you as well because we want to do life with you just like we're doing life with everyone else. And as always, we want to thank you for your incredible giving. Uh, there are three ways that you can give. There are three ways that you can give. You can go to Rehoboth.org slash give. That's Rehoboth.org slash give. Or to you, smile people in the sanctuary right here you can give your gift our offering receptacles are on the back wall back there you can drop your gift in there or you can uh, mail your gift into 2997 Lawrenceville Highway. That's 2997 Lawrenceville Highway. Now we're going to continue in our time of worship as we engage in God's word. Amen. And as Pastor David's going to lead us in God's word today. Good morning church family. I'm going to be reading this morning from Romans chapter 5. I'll be reading verses 1 through 11. It's Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. This is what it says. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ 
through whom we have now received reconciliation. Let us pray. Father, we praise you for the many truths of this passage. We praise you that we are now justified by faith. We praise you that through your Son we have peace with you. That is not something we take lightly because we are aware of the fact that we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of your glory, and yet through justification your Son we can have peace with you. What an amazing blessing. So Father, we praise you that we now have peace with you through your Son. Father, we praise you for the fact that we can have hope. We can have hope both in this life and the next. We just think about this repeated word in these verses of rejoicing. So Father, we just take joy this morning in the many truths of, of these verses. We, we rejoice in our sufferings. And what, a, what an amazing verse that we can rejoice in our sufferings because our suffering produces endurance and, our, and endurance produces character and character produces hope. What an amazing truth. And Father, we think about our brothers and our sisters in Ukraine and in Russia as we read that verse. And we hold on to that verse for them. And Father, we ask that they would be able to rejoice in their sufferings and that you would use their sufferings to produce endurance and character and hope. Father, we think about our brothers and our sisters here in, in, our, in our church family and those who are connected to our church family who have experienced loss and death over the past week. And we hold on to this verse for them. Father, we ask that you would use the trials and the suffering in their lives to produce endurance and character and hope. And Father, we, we are thankful that this is true. We're, we're thankful that our suffering is is not something that's empty, but it's something that you use in our lives to produce endurance and character and hope. Father, we're thankful this morning that while we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. And we, we think for ourselves just how much it would take for us to give up our lives for someone we would consider a good person. And you showed your love for us in that while we were sinners, you sent your son to die for us. What an amazing truth. And Father, we rejoice in that this morning and we praise you that you sent your son to die for us while we were sinners and that you displayed and manifested your love for us in that. Father, we, we praise you that now in Christ we are saved and we are reconciled to you. We are thankful that in Christ, we're not only reconciled to you, but we are reconciled to one another as a family. We praise you for these truths. Father, this, this passage is it's full of, of these incredible truths and remarkable things that you have done for us. So we just praise you this morning for your grace, for your mercy in our lives. We praise you for all that you have done for us while we were yet sinners. What amazing, amazing gifts we see in these verses. We gather together to worship you and praise you this morning. Father, would our praise this morning, would it be pleasant in your sight as we worship you in spirit and in truth and as we worship you not only with our bodies, but our hearts. Father, would you be honored by all that happens here today? Amen. Would you stand over the sanctuary with us?
you take your seat. We don't say this is a worship performance or an experience. When you are worshiping like that, you're not done when you walk off the platform. Isn't that the truth? Come on. Uh, We're going to continue our series in the book of Acts. And today we're going to talk about promises fulfilled. You know, uh, presidents have a tendency to make all kinds of promises, right? Right? They are also very prone not to keep hardly any of those promises. Can I get a witness? But they'll tell you anything you want to hear so that you will give them their vote so they can go do everything they want to do regardless of what they promised you they were going to do. And it doesn't matter whether there's a D or an R or an I or G or whatever related to their party. They're going to make all kinds of promises. But in 1962... President John F. Kennedy is at Rice University, and he gives a speech that would rock the world. Some of you heard that speech, not there, but on television. You certainly heard about it and read about it in the newspapers for days to come. He promised that the United States would choose to go to the moon. Now, when I was a kid, we had some neighbors that would go to matinee movies in the summer, and they'd round up kids and take all of us there, and and, uh, no, these were not black and white movies. I'm not quite that old. But one of the really cool things was that before the movie started, they would play some old black and white movies. Some of y'all know where I'm going. And there was this series called Buck Rogers. Any of y'all remember that? And, 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 you know, and he's the space travels, and this is long before you have CGI and all kinds of computers. You'd look at it today, and it's the hokiest, corniest, but I'm telling you, it was the best. It was awesome. But John F. Kennedy wasn't kidding, and it wasn't going to be a movie. It seemed like an absolute impossibility that you could actually send something into outer space And then if you got it into outer space, you could actually direct it toward the moon as these things are moving thousands of miles an hour. And then you could actually land it on the moon with human beings inside it, and then they could come home. Y'all know July 1969, the United States did it, and posthumously that promise was fulfilled It's an extraordinary thing. If it hadn't been for all that they did in that, you wouldn't be able to go to the fair or or some major carnival or some amusement park and get Dippin' Dots ice cream because it came out of that. Sure enough. Promises are a funny thing. There are some people who make promises and never need to sign a document for that promises. That promise is as good as gold by the word they give. And there are others who make promises. They even put up collateral of money or things they own. They promise with all that they are, sign it, and it is documented that they've signed it, and they don't fulfill it or keep it. And sometimes people think God doesn't keep his promises. The circumstances of life toss us here and there, and sometimes it causes us to think 
God forgot about his promise, or he forgot about us when it came to his promise. As we walk in the book of Acts and we see literally the birth of the church as we have seen and, and then even got to hear our, our, I almost said his name, goodness gracious, I've got to be careful, uh, our partner uh, share with us last week and, and the work that's being done in Africa and they are now back in Africa and those of you who went to the prayer meeting on Monday night, wasn't that a powerful time hearing about the move of God in the advance of his kingdom and the establishment of his church? And it would be very easy for us to think about Acts as as only happening in Jerusalem and then spreading out. And, and it's something that, that launched there, began there, had its fruition there, that, that ultimately that is the beginning. But I'm just telling you, that's the next chapter. It is not the beginning, for God had given promises long before then. What happens in the book of Acts is essentially God saying, I told you so, and letting us see it pulling the curtains back and letting us have a little bit of insight of what he has been about since even before the foundation of the world. Look with me in Acts chapter 1. We're going to begin with verse 15. We're going to go through verse 26. Acts chapter 1. If you've got a printed copy of your Bible, I would encourage you to turn there. Otherwise, scroll on your screen. Acts 1, beginning with verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was in all about 120, and said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled. I'm telling you, if you write in your Bible, I would mark verse 16. Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted in his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and failing, falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language a keldama, which is field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp be desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when it was taken up, when he was taken up from us, one of these must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias and was numbered with the 11 apostles. In our staff prayer time this morning, I told uh, some of our folks that I was struggling because literally these verses right here encapsulate the entire Old Testament. And I haven't figured out yet how to preach all of the Old Testament in the little bit of time that we have this morning. Aren't you glad? But they do. And, and, and often these passages, these few verses, 15 to 26, we, we just kind of gloss over them and we scoot right along. We, we don't pause and sit down and play in the sandbox a while and Dig in here, but it is profound in what God is showing us. In essence, before we ever get to Revelation, he is pulling the curtain back just a little bit and say, saying, look at what I have been up to. 
And I'm telling you this morning, God is putting on grand display his fulfillment of his promises that you and I might have absolute confidence in our Lord that we can trust him in all things. And it doesn't matter what comes our way. It doesn't matter what goes away from us. It doesn't matter what is happening. We can absolutely trust him because he is going to call us to walk boldly in a dark and broken world, to go to places where no one has gone and not stay in our comfort zone. Not stay in the middle of our, our cultural traditions. Not hold on to the things that are most comfortable to us. He's going to call us to forgive one another like our flesh will never be able to do in and of itself. He's going to call us to walk with one another in ways that this world cannot and will not ever understand. He's going to call us to give not out of what we have, but to give sacrificially and generously. Not so that the pastors of the church can drive Bentleys and have jet airplanes. God help them when they give an account. But that we would extend the gospel and the goodness of the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's what he's called us to. And you and I will never have the confidence that we need in order to take those steps unless we truly understand that the one who is sending us is the one that we can actually trust in, lean upon, depend on, and know he will never, ever, ever abandon us. So I want to share with you some pictures, some perspectives of the promises that are shown to be fulfilled in just these few verses. And the first of those is the promise, the kingdom of God will come. It is coming, it has come, and it is yet to come fully. All of those things are true at one time. That is a bit hard for us to get our arms around. It's a bit like talking to that two-year-old and asking them, did you do this? They would make any defense attorney proud. For getting a clear, direct answer from them is incredibly difficult. And yet here, in understanding the kingdom of God, there is no attempt to confuse to deny, but it is a profound reality that you and I need to grasp. Jesus Christ didn't say repent because the kingdom of God's coming some way down the road. He said repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It is here now. And yet it is not totally in its fullness. For he has called on you and I as his disciples to continue to pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed, lifted up, be your name. Your what? Kingdom come. It's an extraordinary thing. We become so focused on what am I doing? What am I getting out of this? That we fail to step back and take a grasp and look into the ages of time and the stars of the universe and see that our God has been at work, is at work, and will continue to be at work as he brings forth not simply your personal salvation, but the redemption of all that there is and his kingdom in its fulfillment. We see glimpses of this in the Old Testament, and I've shared this illustration before. I will share it again because we need to remember. God has chosen in his providence and his wisdom not to tell us everything all at one time. It is like that rose that is opening. And so in Genesis, he doesn't tell us all the things about Jesus and all that Jesus would do. But he gives us a glimpse he flips the light on and it's a small light, but oh, it is an eternal light. 
Notice what he says in Genesis 3 as he is judging the serpent who has led Adam and Eve into rebellion against him. And he says to the serpent, I will put enmity, I will put war between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Now, if it had appeared there, I'd go, yep, I'm right there. There is no such thing as a good snake. You're not going to convince me. Because big ones, little ones, dead ones, and alive ones can cause me to hurt myself. There is no such thing as a good snake. But the reality is, there's not a period there. God didn't finish his statement there. He said, continuing on, he, not all of the offspring, he, one of the offspring shall bruise your head. It is imagery of a mortal wound. And you shall bruise his heel. Image of a wound, a real wound, but it is not terminal. It is a profound initial picture of Jesus Christ himself who would be bruised and literally placed in a tomb dead. But all that tomb couldn't keep him. And he would have ultimate and absolute dominion over that serpent. And he would ultimately take that serpent to its terminal end. We see another glimpse of this incredible picture of God's kingdom coming and his promise to be in, in, in what happens with Abraham and the covenant, which is a promise from God to Abraham. You've heard it taught many, many times, and I just remind you that a covenant in those days always had to be done by two parties that were equal with one another. A superior and an inferior party could not make a covenant with one another. It was not legally possible. It was not culturally acceptable. And here you have the God of the universe, the creator of all that there is, the only holy one, the God of all of humanity, whether they acknowledge him or not. And he comes to Abraham and he makes a promise with Abraham, but Abraham is inferior to him. It is the creator making a promise with the created, and they are not equal. And so this promise is unique it is not both parties promising mutually according to something. It is God making a promise to Abraham and his intent to fulfill that promise. Genesis 12 verses 1 through 3 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, this is before his name is changed, to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. Now, I'm just going to park that for a moment. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, we talk about that being the Great Commission. And Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth have been given me. So let me ask you. Does Jesus have all authority over your life, your things, your pathway, your retirement, your children? Is there anything you would say, no, Lord, not now, Lord, somebody else, Lord? Couldn't be that you're asking me, Lord. I'm not capable. I'm not qualified. I have all of these reasons. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. When the God of the universe who has all authority calls on you, has instructed you, and you put anything or anyone between him and your childlike obedience, mm, that is dangerous territory. And so God tells Abram to go away from his people a place that's safe, a place that's comfortable, a place that reflects his cultural traits and desires. He doesn't even tell him where he's going to go. He just says, I'll show you. Are you willing to follow our Lord into the dark 
when he has not told you what the path is going to look like or how long you're going to walk there. Are you willing to trust him completely to simply do what he asks you to do that's not based on your family's tradition or your cultural preferences or your personal likes or dislikes? Our partner grew up in the country where he's working. I'll be over there in a few weeks, and there's a particular dish, food dish that they serve, that it's one of the few that I've come across that it's like, oh, Lord, please. And our partner knows this, and he always makes sure it gets served to me at some point. I love him except for that. Maybe, maybe more so it's the smile he has while he's watching me try to eat it. But to hear him tell about going to the people in that country that is actually a different ethnic group, though nationally they're of the same country, to take the gospel to them and that they eat something that he can hardly eat, that he's concerned that it would even make him sick, Are you willing to become all things to all people that you might win more to Christ? Because I'm just telling you, it's not about your heritage. It is about us being in the kingdom of God with a new king. And so he tells Abram, go and I will show you. Verse 2, and I will make you a great nation. Hear the promise. And I will bless you, hear that promise, and I will make your name great. All of that sounds really good. And then he says, so that you will be a blessing. I'm telling you, God's never made anybody a blessing that he didn't take from them. You will not be a blessing to others until you're willing to give everything. Your time, your patience, your forgiveness, your gentleness, your heart. And then he says, I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, hear this, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That right there, the gospel is tucked in though it's not on full display. Everything about Jesus Christ and his coming is tucked in there, though it's not on full display until God unpacks it as time moves on. Everything about the kingdom of God is tucked in there, but God doesn't unpack it all right then. All he has done is called Abram, go and I'll show you where to go. That's it. There are things about the kingdom of God that God has yet to choose to tell us or show us. He has simply said, seek first, what? My kingdom and my righteousness. Seek first my kingdom. Not your kingdom, my kingdom and your righteousness. Now watch this. Coming all the way back to this passage here in Acts. And you see what's taking place here in this promise being fulfilled. This passage is about Judas. Not Judah, Judas. Once in a while you come across somebody and you ask them what their name is and they say Judas. And you're thinking, what were your parents thinking? And if you're named Judas, we love you. We question what your parents were thinking. But we love you. Judas has become a name synonymous with like Benedict Arnold in our American history. And Satan influencing Judas and Judas making every decision he wanted does everything he can to stop God's plan to make God a liar and to make sure God's promise was not going to be fulfilled. That's what Judas was about. And what this text is showing us is that Judas could not stop the promise of the kingdom of God. And then you have Peter. I mean, this is crazy. Absolutely crazy. Who is it that stands up in the midst? I mean, you might think it'd be John. They're like, who in the world put Peter there? 
Did you know what he did? Peter standing with a young teenager. Now, now understand, Peter's young himself. Maybe 18, maybe 19. Maybe a hair older, but not much. And he's talking to probably a a 14, 15, maybe 16-year-old young girl. And she calls him out and says, hey, aren't you one of them? And here this tough, strong fisherman who still has the calluses on his hands, who is willing to pull his knife out, and he whips off the ear of the guard who's going to arrest Jesus, and he wilts like a cheap paper bag. Not once, not twice, three times. Peter could not stop God's sovereign plan in the fulfillment of his kingdom. And then Jesus. All of the, those who were following Jesus are looking for him to establish and restore the political kingdom of Israel. They are looking for him to overthrow the Roman government. They are looking for him to literally set aside all of the, the cultic gods of the Romans and the Greeks that are being followed. They are looking for God himself in Jesus to restore the kingdom of Israel as they would think. And then what happens? Jesus, the one who has raised others from the dead, is killed on a cross. It was a public spectacle. People would go to watch the crucifixions. It was a horror show of horror shows. People would bet on them. How long will they live? How long before they cry out? Will they have to break their knees over here? And he's killed. He dies. And it it wasn't uncommon for a person to hang on the cross Not just hours, but a day, sometimes two days, sometimes three days before. He didn't even make it a day. And he's dead. And it wasn't that Peter then jumps up and John jumps up and goes, hey, this was the plan all along. Jump in line. Run forward with us. That's not what happened at all. They ran away like scared children. And they went and hid. But I'm telling you, when they came to the tomb and the angels are standing there, why are you here looking for him? He is not here. Profound fulfillment of the promise that God has given that his kingdom would come and Judas and Peter and those who would crucify Jesus could not stop his promise. Dear friends, if that's all we looked at in this text, it would be sufficient that it ought to propel us to the ends of the earth. It ought to lead us to lay everything we have before Jesus. Not when we get to heaven and get that crown. We ought to lay it all before him now and say, Yes, Lord, for your kingdom. For you are faithful. Regardless of what you face in your life, regardless of how heavy a burden you carry, knowing that it is short-lived for his kingdom in its total fulfillment is coming. Notice what Jesus told his disciples when he asked them, who are they saying I am? And he had all kinds of answers. And then finally he asked them, well, who do you think I am? And Peter tells him, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You are the Savior. You are the Son of God. And Jesus answers to him, he says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Notice, he's not building his church on Peter. There is no pastor God has ever built his church on. Can I get a witness? Maybe you didn't have to do it quite so loudly. But it's the truth. There's no singer, there's no theologian. 
There's no pastor, there's no preacher, there's no evangelist. God has never built his church on me or on you. He has built it on Christ. And Christ is the king of the kingdom. And on this rock I will build my church. And hear these words, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He's not talking about physical gates in that moment. He is talking about all things related to Satan and his schemes and his dominions. There is nothing that Satan would bring against God's plan that can ever prevail. There is no one that Satan can bring against God's plans that ultimately will prevail. You and I don't simply have victory in Jesus at the graveyard. We have victory in Jesus in this life and in your yard and in this world and all the way into the next and we ought to be living that way. And that's what he's telling us in this text. The second promise that you see here is that he will forgive us of our sins. Again, Peter has gone from an impulsive follower of Jesus to an embarrassing traitor. And now he is the respected leader? How in the world? Now I just need to step in and say something here. There is not a pastor There is not a leader in a church that's not a sinner. There's not one. And God will and does with their their faith and their repentance showing evidences of this will genuinely forgive any pastor, frankly, of any sin. But in the world in which we live, it is necessary that I would say that there are some sins that while Christ may forgive them, permanently disqualify a pastor from ever serving as a pastor, a shepherd, an elder, a leader in a church. And it doesn't matter how much a church likes them. It doesn't matter how charismatic they are. It doesn't matter how much money they've raised before God. There are qualifications that every pastor ought to be held to. And that is not the same as saying Christ forgives them or doesn't forgive them. I think the matter of abuse, especially sexual abuse, is one of those areas that if a man is ever, ever guilty of such things, while if they genuinely repent, will know the forgiveness of Christ, they should never be allowed to lead in leadership in a church. You say, well, why did you step on that? There are churches that seem to have just lost their minds on things that are so righteously simple. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But he doesn't stop there. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Peter failed miserably. And it wasn't just that his peers knew he had failed miserably. Peter knew he had failed miserably. And yet after his resurrection, Christ comes to him and he restores him. And Peter demonstrates remarkable, tender, transparent repentance and forgiveness. And we see even in him being the one to stand up and make these declarations, him being the one, the respected leader here, it is not because Peter is the best among them. He is not even the one who has maybe sinned the least publicly. But he has been forgiven And he is not disqualified from leading. Folks, you and I need to understand every one of us are sinners. Every one of us. And there may be things that you and I would do that are wrongs and sinful that would disqualify us from some things. There are certainly things that will close doors in our lives. But I'm just telling you that it is important that you and I remember, and even in this text, God shows us and reminds us clearly, He is a God who forgives and adores those He has saved. Don't ever let Satan cripple you, bind you up in the lie 
that what you've done makes you unusable by God. You are not. For in fact, you are in the very center of his plan to expand and extend his kingdom. Here's how I can absolutely prove that you are still qualified if you're genuinely a follower of Jesus to be a part of the advance of his kingdom. If you are breathing, you are qualified if you are genuinely a follower of Christ. You say, well, my legs don't work as well. He never said you had to have the best legs to be able to do this. So, well, my ears don't work as well. Well, maybe you should be really careful about what you think you heard, but you're still not disqualified. Well, I don't have a lot. You never needed it. Peter didn't have anything. How in the world Satan has done such a great job teaching people and influencing people to think that if they don't have a lot, God can't use them. In fact, most of the people that the Lord has used the most in the Scriptures had the least. They were just simply willing to say, yes, Lord, and to trust that he would fulfill his promises. This promise to us that he would forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When, when you get into a bed that the sheets have been freshly washed, so some of you right now, you just, you're, you're, you're just right there. Don't go to sleep on me. Oh, that refreshing, fresh, that he would forgive you of your sins and afresh wash you. That's his promise to you if you'll walk in him. And he is showing that even in Peter's life. Another promise that we see here is that Israel would be restored. Now, now track with me on this. So the 12 apostles, they truly are symbolic of the 12 leaders, the 12 elders of the tribes of Israel. They are not the elders of the tribes of Israel, but they are symbolic of them. Just as I would contend that the 24 thrones around the throne of God in heaven represent both the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. But one of these apostles is now gone. And there are but 11 of them. This text centers on the restoration of one of those. See, in Isaiah 49, verse 6, God's word says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the, the preserved of Israel. I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And then even in Luke chapter 22, where the apostle Luke, not the apostle, where Luke is being led to write according to the scriptures that ultimately God would establish his kingdom and the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel. It's an extraordinary picture of what's happening here and God showing his fulfillment of his promise to restore Israel. Now, just keep hanging with me a minute. This is not about the physical restoration of Israel as a physical nation. But it is something that you and I should have a real grasp of because in Romans chapter 4 and Romans chapter 5, and in Galatians chapter 3 and Galatians chapter 4, I'd encourage you to go home and read it if it's not fresh in your mind. I'd encourage you to really wrestle with this because in Romans 4, God's word says, but the words, it was counted to him, talking about Abraham. How is it that righteousness was counted to Abraham? It was through his faith. And these texts here in Romans 4 says, but the words... It was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus Christ our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. To put a fine point on it, hear what Galatians 3.28 says. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, hear this, then you are Abraham's offspring, 
heirs, heirs according to the promise. What we are seeing is the promise here that was given to Abraham. That promise that he would be a blessing to others and that ultimately that blessing would extend to the nations is that the promise of being a child of Abraham, a child of the promise, inheriting the inheritance that God promised Abraham was never guaranteed through circumcision of the flesh. It was always guaranteed through the circumcision of the heart that is talked about in the Old Testament. And it is this promise being fulfilled in the restoration of 11 apostles now to be made 12 as they they replace Judas is a symbolic picture that God ultimately is fulfilling his promise and restoring Israel to its fulfillment that it would extend out into the nations And that all would become children of the promise who turn and follow Jesus Christ. It's an amazing connection to the Old Testament. Now since we're here walking around and thinking about apostles, let me just say this. There were the twelve and there were some others who were called apostles. Not many in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul is certainly a unique apostle. In many ways identical to the twelve apostles. But there were some others who were called apostles. Barnabas and Titus and Epaphroditus are all called apostles. But them being apostles is very distinct and different from the 12 and from the apostle Paul. For the 12 actually served as apostles in the role of an office, functionally with a title apostle. These others represent what a common usage of the word apostle was, just simply meant messenger. It wasn't this grand office. It wasn't this unique title. And so you have others being called messengers or in the text in English, oftentimes it's not even translated apostle. It's translated messenger. And here's why I say that. Judas was replaced. But when Peter died, Peter was never replaced. When Paul dies, Paul is never replaced. There is no account of any of these apostles ever being replaced after this. Is it okay to use the term apostle, talking about one being sent out to be a messenger, proclaiming the gospel to those who are not followers of Jesus? I would think so. But the idea that there are apostles today with a unique title and a unique office is just not supported by the scriptures. And part of the reason is is that these apostles... were not simply those who walked with Jesus and firsthand saw Jesus... But they had a unique place and role in the propelment of the kingdom of God. And you and I walk in their heritage. We stand in the promise that God would restore Israel. But that promise is guaranteed first and foremost through the promise that was given in Abraham through Jesus. Finally, the last promise we'll take a minute to look at is the promise that God would judge those that oppose Jesus. We can't walk away from this text and not see this. Judas is a stark picture of this, of one who walked right with Jesus. He was so close and so trusted in the group that he is actually the treasurer in the group. And you don't give your money to people you don't trust, right? If you're struggling with that, let's talk about it. You don't give your money to people you don't trust. They trusted him. He walked with them everywhere. He was a part of all of the ministry. He had even proclaimed the gospel out of his own lips. And yet his heart was as twisted, evil, broken, sinful, unrepentant as Satan's has ever been. He is an example and a picture, a symbol, that there is a judgment coming for all who would oppose Jesus Christ. There are but two paths in life. And all of us, all of us, as we pass through the end of this life, will either be on one of those two paths. There is no middle ground. 
He is a picture of one that represents the judgment that is coming for all who would turn away from Christ, even if they walk right beside him. Are you hearing me, church? I'm afraid sometimes the people that are in the greatest danger of not hearing the gospel are those who hear it all the time. It has become boring. It has become common. It has become irritating. In Matthew 12, verses 36 to 37, God's word says, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. Listen to the words that justify us. Because if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Friends, this is an extraordinary picture of the promises of God that he is fulfilling that you and I should take great account of. We should have unbelievable confidence walking forward as we see what God has done and his promises fulfilled. As we know that he had a plan before the beginning of the world and it is his plan and intent that he is going to fulfill that plan. The question is, where do you fit in that plan? Are you one who has been forgiven of your sins that you might walk with him? Or are you one who still walks under the judgment of Christ? Are you one who has tasted the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you've believed the lies of Satan and you're too busy to walk after the kingdom? You're too distracted to seek first the kingdom of God? I'm telling you, he has called us with great promises that are even more confident than President Kennedy saying in 1962 that America chooses to go to the moon. I'm going to tell you now, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I can tell you now that they won't be saved. Unless someone goes and someone proclaims the good news to them. And God's commissioning, God's plan is that you, his people, would go. And the confidence and the hope is not in anything you've done, anything you've learned, anything that anyone has told you. Your confidence and hope is that his promises are sure. And when he declares to his disciples all authority, on heaven and earth has been given me. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And lo, I will be with you to the end of the age. He won't send you any place where he's not. You can't go any place where he's not with you. And I'm telling you, you don't need your bank account your wallet, your purse, the little coin thing in your car, or your pay app on your phone for your confidence to go. All you need is confidence in the promise of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for showing us what you have been about since before the foundation of the world and how you are bringing it to its completion. Father, that we would respond to you today for all of us who already walk after our Savior, that we would do so with increased boldness and confidence today. And Father, any who are hearing this message, who are listening online If today is the day they would desire to trust you for their salvation, that in this moment right now, they would cry out to you, oh God, save me. To the name of Jesus we pray. 
Amen. May we stand.
ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Come on, sing that with us, come on. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Celebrate Jesus in this house today. We do thank you for worshiping with us today. Again, if this is your very first time worshiping with us, or if you've never met us at our um, welcome table, we would that you would meet us right over there. Brad is right standing over there. Uh, we'd love to give you a special gift just to say thank you to all of you who have showed up today. We just want to say God bless you, love you, and be encouraged that God is not through with you no matter what your age is, no matter where you are in life. God still wants to do something in your life. God bless you. Have an incredible, incredible week. You pray. Will ever be on 